little handout here, which I hope you will have a look at and hand back at the end, basically, um, because I'm looking to see what interest there, there are, is in, in future seminars, what sort of topics you'd like to see. Maybe if you've got a preference for a particular time, uh, for example, a day of the week, those sorts of things also, if you can feedback on that. But what I say at the beginning of this is that the idea here is not simply to get someone to come and present some ideas to you or an opinion or an analysis, but in the, the spirit of popular education, and which is empowering and participatory, to try and help develop some tools to understand issues. In other words, not just to talk about a particular issue, but to talk about the method behind it and, the, and the, the debate behind it. Because as you know, there's different languages out there. I mean languages that economists speak certain languages and politicians speak certain languages, apart from actual languages. So even talking about theories of imperialism, for example, I thought I'd start by introducing, as I used to do in some of my classes, some of the general theories out there before we apply them to certain circumstances. That means talking about sets of ideas, uh, in this case from the Marxist tradition, but not just from the Marxist tradition, um, so that we can learn to use certain tools and step, step out of ourselves a little bit, our opinion, to look at the, at the language of talking about imperialism or big projects of domination and looking at it from, from different ways. Because there isn't just one theory, there's a few different approaches to it. There are debates out there, and for us to engage in debates, we need to have those sorts of tools to be able to switch backwards and forwards between certain views. Everyone's got some experience of that in different contexts, but here I want to do it a little bit to do with um, theories of imperialism before we talk about some of the actual, some of the actual conflicts. So in your hand you've got now, I hope, a piece of paper which talks about um, a few areas I want to walk through. And I think um, the best format might be if I walk through this material, but if you, at any stage you want to add something or ask something, just put up your hand and let's have a discussion. Because what you are thinking about may be what someone else is thinking about. And it probably makes more sense to do it that way. Having said that, I'm going to walk through this material just slowly, but feel free to, to jump in and, and ask some questions. I'm going to start by talking about, really it's not so much Marxist theories of imperialism, because Karl Marx himself in the 19th century did really say hardly anything about imperialism. There was nothing there, really. Uh, it's a concept that was developed. Of course, imperialism didn't begin with Marxism either. It was, it's a much older phenomenon. Um, linked to colonialism. In many respects, colonialism, it, it was a creature of imperialism. But the Marxists got interested in it, and particularly in the political economic side of it, in the 20th century. And uh, it begins with this man, the leader of the Russian Revolution, uh, familiar to many of you, you may even have seen his little pamphlet on imperialism um, prior to the, the Russian Revolution. And the context is all important, as a lot of ideas are. A lot of ideas are formed in very specific contexts. Um, most of the uh, even theorists who talk about their theories in supposedly technical terms develop them in quite particular contexts. You know, um, for example, Adam Smith when talking about his theories of the wealth of nations, or David Ricardo talking about uh, free trade at the time of corn laws and so on. They were very particular circumstances. When Lenin was started to talk about imperialism, he was, there was the middle of the First World War, the huge, this huge conflagration between the imperial powers in Europe. There were multiple imperial powers in Europe. There was a war going on. Why was it going on? There was no interest for the working people in, in Russia as, as the Bolsheviks saw it to be involved in this war. Uh, and so they had this con they developed this concept of revolutionary defeatism. But why, were, why was this war going on? Why were the big empires dragging the rest of the world into these wars um, in the interests of elites within those empires. So Lenin was influenced by, of course, by Marx and Engels, um, but also by a radical liberal guy called John Hobson, a, an English radical liberal. The liberals were split, really, on imperialism. Some of them were very pro-imperialism. Uh, Important today, because you notice that today we have, for example, in the US what's called the liberals or the, the, the democrats, with their own version of exceptionalist, exceptionalist North American discourse. 
that there is a type of liberal imperialism in the world, there has always been, which has a different flavour to the conservative or the realist liberalism, which is the George W. Bush or the Donald Trump blunt and crude approach to this is what we want and we're going to go and get it, basically. Um, if you look back to John Stuart Mill, who was an English liberal, famous for talking about ideas of individual freedom, he was a, a great fan of the British Empire and British colonialism. He didn't believe in independence for the colonies. He thought that England was delivering huge benefits to the world. And indeed, US liberals today, um, there's a man whose name escapes me at the moment, um, but it's something about freedoms, freedoms battle, freedom struggle, um, has adapted uh, John Stuart Mill's uh, has adapted his ideas to has adapted John Stuart Mill's ideas to the US approach of humanitarian intervention, which is something really from uh, the beginning of this century, from about the year 2000. And so some of you who may remember the debates in US foreign policy in the last century, in the 20th century, where they spoke of hawks and doves, and hawks were thought to be the, uh, the conservatives. And the doves were, were supposed to be the liberals. Um, that no longer applies. Uh, that, that no longer applies. Um, a white paper that the Clinton administration had in the year 2000 found that the enthusiasm for intervention was strongest, not from the military, not from US intelligence, but from the State Department, the, the, the group of diplomats, and their paper was written by a director of Human Rights Watch, one of the supposed NGOs that's a uh, supposed watchdog for uh, human rights. So the idea of human rights intervention, the aggressiveness of human rights intervention is something relatively new, but it has those roots back in the 19th century in classical English liberalism. So, uh, but in this case, John Hobson was anti-imperialist. Anti he, uh, he was saying there's too many costs here. We've alienated, the British have alienated most of the world, you know, the Indians, a lot of the Africans and so on. We've got them all against us and it's bad for business. It's only helping certain privileged groups that hang around the, the British state. So Hobson was a, a, a radical liberal. There were lots of different types of liberals. And he was against it. And he also said that, look, um, imperialism is actually driven by these bogus. The people that want a slice of India and, and parts of Africa and so on, uh, they want to invest there and they push the state into doing that. Now, he didn't really have necessarily a lot of evidence for it. The question was, does, do the investors push the flag or do the investors follow the flag? But it was an idea that was appealing to Lenin and Lenin tried to put it in his own terms, drawing on a guy called Hilfiding who was doing some calculations about finance capital at the time. And what that meant was that they were filtering and Lenin was studying capitalism in the early 20th century, which wasn't competitive in the way Marx spoke of it, but rather monopolies. There were these big monopolies that controlled things. So in Lenin had two strong ideas. I don't want to spend too much time here, but two strong ideas. One was that imperialism was driving war. And he says this in the middle of a huge war, basically. That's what happened to our lights there. <laughs> um, imperial competition drives the war. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, the British Empire, the Russian Empire. And there is economic domination. A simple way to talk about imperialism. There is domination through financial monopolies. The, the banks were uh, assuming much greater roles in the influence over the state and over the empire. So there are two initial thoughts from uh, Lenin, which were very influential, still influential on, on Marxist after him. Later in the 20th century, we've got a number of other neo-Marxists. Neo-Marxists, because they're revising Marx's ideas, they're drawing on some of his ideas, but they're adding some of their own ideas about, uh, in particular, to build on this idea that the cap capitalism of the 20th century is not really about markets. They talk about it as markets and competition. It's not really about markets. It's about big monopolies, big corporations. It was since the late 19th century, really. What Marx finishes writing in the 1860s or something, that the joint stock companies only just started to get going there. Once you have the joint stock company, those companies get very big. Um, those big European and US companies began to control 
a lot of major industries. Yes, you had real markets and you know fruit and vegetables and other areas and so on. Um, not all fruit and vegetables. We've got monopolies in some areas there too. But a, a lot of the, the big industry was uh, in monopolies, and that meant you, they had to uh, think. It had to rethink uh, what was this economic system now. It wasn't really about competitive markets in quite the way that Marx spoke of. There were liberals talking that way too, institutional liberals or the institutionalists were a school in their own in the US. A uh, man called Thorsten Veblen later influenced people like John Kenneth Galbraith and so on who wrote about capitalism as, or the fundamental power in society as the corporation. The big company is the fundamental power. It's more powerful than the states, they said a hundred years ago. Basically, that's the institutional school. Um, a number of these people put their particular contributions in. I'm going to skim over them, basically. But this idea of monopoly power characterises neo-Marxists from the Marxists, that monopoly power is what distinguishes contemporary capitalism and um, analysis has to base on it. In that way, monopoly finance capital has to have a big role in imperialist ventures, in the the push for what they call the push for the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. There was the, the end of the colonial period, a huge scramble where the Europeans carved up Africa in a very short space of time, which hadn't been thoroughly colonized in the way that some other parts of the world had been. Um, one important idea that comes out of this from the North Americans, Paul Brunner and Paul Squeezy, is that you have something going on at an international level. You have a struggle going on between imperialism and resistance. Now, this is interesting because if we're talking about imperialism, imperialism is a theory of power, right? It's about power. But what else do you have with, with power? You have to have resistance. As with class, you know, with class is a theory of power. Uh, capital, rather, is a theory of power. Capital is about power, a certain form of power, owning the means of production. But you have resistance, which is the working class, by and large. Although, that's been developed over the time to include other sections of society, including peasants and other groups, for example. So in talking about imperialism as a theory of power, the other side of the coin has to be resistance. Resistance to power. What is it, though, in this international context? Because we can't simply talk about class struggle at an international level. It's not so simple. We have states, we have relations between states, and we have to incorporate that in some sort of way. This is why it's fairly unhelpful, I believe, to talk about all states being the same, or um, state capitalism, for example. One state system, China's the same as the US is the same as Russia. They're not exactly the same. They're different, and those differences are rather important to understand international struggles. Um, similarly with resistance. Resistance has a certain character, which is to oppose the domination of power, but how does it do that? Uh, I suggest that it does that in particular circumstances, and particular physical circumstances, and particular cultural circumstances. So resistance, when we come to talk about the resistance to wars of imperialism, for example, has to have characters which are rather conditioned historically. This is a very Marxist idea, really, because one of Marxist uh, elements of theory, of method, sorry, was to talk about historical materialism, that, that conditions, historical conditions, determine the development of social relations and also of resistance. But he wrote less about resistance. So in this context, the neo-Marxist theories of uh, imperialism and the role of monopoly capital was to say that, look, you have class power, you have this creation of a surplus where the employers are getting a surplus out of workers, um, but they're able to do this at a far greater level in the colonies, where they are controlling, administering life in a much more severe way. They develop a huge amount of surplus there. And then there's a second phase. The monopoly power can siphon the surplus out of those colonies, or neo-colonies, to the centre, the areas where monopoly capital exists. London and New York, where you have the, let's say, we're talking about coffee, for example. I can say that because I know a little bit about coffee. The industry. Um, you've got the Starbucks and the Procter and & Gamble and Nestle's, you've got a handful of big companies that buy the big monopsonies, they buy most of the coffee. Um, they sell it for ten times what the grower of coffee gets for it. So there's a big value chain there. 
And what they're effectively doing is getting the lion's share of the surplus, surplus used in a more general sort of sense there, um, from the small producers, basically. So this idea of surplus is not just extracted by la um, from labour by capital, but it's also extracted through monopoly power in international relations by large corporations. Um, you can apply this to a lot of different industries. Is something the neo-Marxists develop in different ways. There isn't just one neo-Marxist theory here. There's a few. There's dependency theory, world systems theory, a few of them. They're not exactly the same, but they share this foundation on talking about society as uh, social relations as uh, revolving around the hub of power of monopoly capital. So you have, for example, a number of um, theorists from the former colonies, from Latin America, from the Caribbean, uh, from India, talking about a surplus in that sort of way, in a general sort of use of the term, that was extracted from the colonies. Um, Utsa Patnaik, who Jay can tell you more about, said that Britain plundered $45 trillion from India during the Raj days, simply by controlling the entire economy, the currency, the resources. In Latin America, you might have seen Eduardo Galeano's book, The Open Veins of Latin America, which is a popular history which talks about all of the gold and silver that was extracted by Spain and Portugal um, uh, across these. I think uh, Galeano says he could have built a, a bridge out of silver and gold across the oceans to Cadiz, you know, where the ships were arriving. And the other, Hugo Chavez made some comments about if you a modest level of interest on the debt that was owed to Latin America by Portugal and Spain, more than the GDP of Europe would be owned, owed to Latin America as a result of that process. And similarly, um, a guy called um, Eric Williams, uh, who became the president of Trinidad and Tobago, but when he was a young man in, in London, wrote his PhD on the slave industry in, in the West Indies and the, the role of sugar in the British economy. Uh, and the, what he says is a very strong role of the sugar industry in financing the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Um, so uh, from the Caribbean, from Latin America, from India, you have parallel uh, histories being developed you know, in, in, in to the current day, talking about, well, what really developed the economies and the industries of the, of the wealthy countries. So you could talk about Japan too, and the role of Japan over centuries in the Korean Peninsula in China, uh, because Japan is really a very resource poor country, but a very well educated and technologically capable country. But they developed their empire precisely, not precisely in the same way, but on similar principles to the European empires, basically. So this is a, a brief sort of tour around some of the neo Marxist ideas of, of imperialism and the changing idea of a surplus and the role of monopoly power on top of the simple class relations that are spoken of. Anyone want to chip in at this stage? Yeah. I just want to say that Lennon also talked about the domination of, of finance capital over <coughs> other kinds and since Lennon's wrote the theory you can see that in time Finance capital has dominated and, and become more monopolised and controls more power. I mean, just trading of money daily is more than any of the manufactured and GDP of the thick goods produced, just the, the money floating around in the big gambling casino. So that's an aspect of Lenin that I think is really worth because that's the, the power behind the throne is that finance that moves around and controls things. Yes, I think you're right. The Lenin did speak about the relations between the different fractions of capital, and those ideas have been developed even more in the recent decades um, to talk about, you know, for example, that states, well, the Australian state, let's say, was when they started to abolish tariffs, um, they were had regard to what finance capital wanted, and finance capital had no interest in tariffs. Manufacturing industry, yes, wanted tariffs to protect industry, but finance capital had no interest in that. And so there was a hierarchy between the fractions of capital, which are more evident in recent times. I think last time I looked at it, 
you know, the amount of jobs and the con contribution in terms of uh, the turnover of income in, in finance capital uh, more than doubled between the early 70s and the, and the late 90s in this country. So it's, it's assumed an even greater power than, than it was 100 years ago. That's, that's very true. Any other observations there? This is also consistent with the neo-Marxist approach to monopoly capital, that we're looking at monopoly and monopoly fractions which exert an influence on other forms of capital, basically. Marx spoke, wrote about this in a competitive sense, that big capital was always absorbing, breaking down and swallowing up little capital, for example, but um, he didn't really get into the areas of monopoly to the extent that these guys do. Now, uh, yeah. Um, I have an engineering question. Yeah. Is this Good. time for engineering questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you accept that resistance in each particular country has to be different based on culture and historical circumstances, then how will the relationship between countries change? Basically. So if, if you say you accept, um, uh, what's, what's the theory called? Frank, um, world systems theory and so on and so on, that part of the thing. Oh, the Wallerstein yeah. world systems theory? Yeah. The, the, that's one branch of neo-Marxism which emphasizes the integration of these different systems, which leads to a bit of a, what do you say, determinism, doesn't it? So yeah. if, if everything's determined by global power, what's the point of resistance, basically? But the point of the resistance on a day-to-day -day level is people survive and keep their jobs and keep their incomes. <laughs> yeah. at, a, at a greater level, or you say the resistance in Lebanon eventually kicked out Israel from South Lebanon, basically, you know, using the cultural and physical resources that they had at, at their disposal. You know. And you know, have they conquered Israel? Well, in a particular sense, yes. In a general sense, no. You know. So uh, that's what I'm saying. In particular circumstances, there's going to be cultural assets and physical assets which are used to resist. You know, if you, I've lost my job, <laughs> I, I uh, have a legal recourse, but I don't really believe in legal systems too much, you know, so I'm going to do other things to run my life in the meantime, basically. So there are tools that we, we draw on depending on the confidence we have and also the people we can combine with together. To, you know, if there are, there's, for example, in South Lebanon, there's a very strong cohesive force that's, that has to do with religion that enables people to unify, and a small group of people unified can... The MUI is a very good example. The MUI is quite a small union. But now they have a dispute, the one that... The dispute that Paul rushed off to deal with... Uh, no, sorry, that's a different one. They, they've always got disputes. There is a dispute in Pakistan at the moment. Two of the, of the maritime union equivalents are in jail in Pakistan, but because the... Um, the maritime unions, or the wharf and the seamen's unions, are very well coordinated. They can coordinate with Australia, with Jakarta, with other ports. You know, so in other words, they have the capacity to organise amongst themselves. There, similarly, in the resistance in Lebanon is very small. Lebanon is a very small country, but when they're very organised, they can harass and e eject a very what appears to be a very powerful army, the Israeli army from Lebanon. So resistance has its possibilities in different circumstances, but the shape of it is going to be different, basically. Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't know you go ahead. Thank you. American uh, or Western uh, attack on Iraq and Syria. And the Western countries, they attacked Iraq and Syria, destroyed their whole infrastructure. And do you think there's an example of a monopoly destroying it, then going in and saying, let's have contracts uh, to, uh, to rebuild this place, and we take all your oil? Okay. But at the moment, it seems that that strategy isn't working, because Iran has suddenly jumped in, and they are doing contracts. Am I right, or? Yeah, you're, there are building blocks that you are seeing there. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's still a big picture that sits above that, but the building blocks are right, aren't they? That people are cooperating in the region, yeah. and this project is failing. But what they're trying to do by destruction, I think, is it's not. It's true. There's an industry of destruction. There's a there's a war industry too, of course. Mm -hmm. And one of the down one of one of the many downsides of imperialism is that it stimulates a war economy. You know that instead of producing goods, it's producing these bads, but they produce jobs and so on. Yeah. Um, but the, and similarly with the destruction, and, and it, the destruction 
eventually leads to a, a construction boom, of course. After every war, there's a construction boom. But there's something else that's going on, isn't it? They're trying to destroy independent states in the region. Yes. Because if the people get together, it, the big obsession of the Israelis and the US at the moment is what they call, it's their idea for an Iranian land bridge. An Iranian land bridge from Tehran to Beirut. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Beirut. And in the other circumstance, a marvellous development for the peoples of the region. You know, transport, industry, tourism, all that sort of stuff. Wonderful. You know, hop on the train, even just to, for train, train lovers, hop on the train from Tehran to Beirut or Beirut to Tehran. Wonderful. You know, make much easier for our friend Hussein who wants to visit Iran. You know, he hops on the train, very fast train and goes to Tehran. Excellent. Uh, but this means the integration of those peoples. You notice the US is losing in Syria, but they're sitting on the border. They're sitting on the border of um, Jordan and Iraq and Syria. They're sitting on the border of Iraq and Syria. They're up on the north of the border with Turkey and, and Syria to try and divide those people. Because the Iranian land bridge is a big fear, and Iran is a big fear, because it's a big country that's helping integrate the resistance there. Iran is helping Palestine, it's helping Lebanon, it's helping Syria, it's helping Iraq, it's helping Yemen. This is why they hate Iran so much. It's not because they're Muslims or some type of Muslim or Shia Muslim or anything like that. It's because they are independent and they're helping unite those people. But an imperial power has to smash those sorts of bonds down. They wanted to divide Pakistan and India. They wanted to divide Ireland. They wanted to divide Palestine and Lebanon and Lebanon from Syria and so on. These are the legacies that we live with of, of colonialism. Sorry. Yeah. How sustainable is a theory of resistance over a long period of time? Um, I, I, I think specifically about southern Lebanon, and I ask myself, how much longer can they keep resisting? And is their resistance going to have to be evolutionary over time? Will it have to change over time? Well, I think resistance has to adapt to circumstances, doesn't it? Um, it has to adapt to circumstances. Are the circumstances going to change? Just as imperialism or its subsets has to have, and colonialism have to adapt to circumstances too. South Africa had to adapt to pressure. If that pressure increases over time, Israel will have to adapt to that pressure too, basically. So um, the resistance has to adapt to those sort of circumstances. If it doesn't, then it's in trouble, isn't it? If some new factor comes along and the resistance doesn't adapt. But I'm saying if you take a historical approach to resistance, you can't say, idealistically, this is what the resistance should be. Because the resistance has its own character. Well, other than South Africa, is there a, is there a precedent to a sustained uh, resistance? Well, the whole decolonial process, um, I mean, every uh, decolonization process had a long history and its own particular tools that were developed, its own history and its successes and failures and so on. And Latin America is particularly rich in that, you find it, because Latin America had a decolonization process across the continent and because they then spoke of a, a second uh, independence from the comprador elites that in, immediately engaged with the, with the imperialists and that they had to overthrow their own, the, 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 their own bourgeoisie, more or less that um, they've spoken about it in terms, and they have some general shared ideas, which I think are particularly relevant to the Middle East in a lot of ways, that one of them was um, from Bolivar to Chavez, and, um, and, and the thing that, that Hugo Chavez is maybe best remembered for is that the little countries of the world can't resist the big powers individually. They have to join together in some way. And that was what they called the Bolivarian Revolution. Why Bolivar? Because Bolivar tried to do that and failed 200 years ago. But they spoke of it 200 years ago in the same sort of way. And um, uh, how it would happen um, is another story. And, um, and the, the forces that would be used to sabotage it uh, is another story. You know, North and South Korea is another is another story with its own particular history. Let me just divert for a moment into the other side, just to give you an idea of um, where liberalism, um, where liberal ideology tried to counter this. Because the economic aspects of neo-Marxist theories of imperialism were quite powerful and quite influential in a lot of, particularly in 
um, a lot of uh, uh, former colonised countries that were still seeing neo-colonial relations or domination through large companies, basically. Now, liberalism has never been very strong on theories of history. There's no really very good theories of history in liberalism because, as you know, it stresses individualism and choice and opportunity and all these sorts of things, which have nothing really to do with the development of the big, powerful imperial states, basically, because there was a huge amount of state coordination of, of their investment and their operations and so on. But nevertheless, they developed some theories um, which are worth mentioning, I guess, um, to try and... And I, I introduce them just so you can see problems with them and, and, and the responses that came back. So the, one of them was called this, um, this theory of sustained growth um, by Walt Rostow in 1960. In the middle of the Cold War in the US, this guy who was linked into the liberal side of US politics, Walt Rostow, spoke about every developing country, as they called them then, um, can develop, industrialise in the way that Japan did and Britain did and so on. These are the stages you have to go through. And Rostow goes through, you know, you have to, first of all, you have to enclose the lands, as they did in Britain, you know, uh, enclose all the commons, individualise it, you know, they, he sort of leaves out the highland clearances and some of the uglier parts of, of that sort of enclosure movement. But you, you need to get a surplus from agriculture and then invest it in these industries in the city and then you get Manchester and the development of industry and so on. So it's, it's totally an internal sort of idea of how Britain industrialised and if you follow these steps, Tanzania or whatever country it is, you can do the same sort of thing. Um, and there's some logic to it, you know, because indeed there was an enclosure movement, there was big landowners that invested in the surface. Actually there was a lot of friction between the big landowners in Britain and industrialists. This is what precisely what David Ricardo was writing about. Um, but nevertheless, there's the idea, and you can see it's called the Non-Communist Manifesto, which gives you a sense of the character of it. It was specifically intended to be uh, oppositional to the idea of the ideas of, of neo-Marxist imperialism at the time. Another one, and this is uh, particularly a North American theory, hegemonic stability theory, but it will be familiar to you because it's repeated in the media such a lot, and you know it's part of the, the North American legacy that we all get fed on as we grow up, more or less. Hegemonic stability theory. This is really a type of theory of imperialism because it, it also stresses um, the presence of a single dominant power, but in a good sense, in that we all need a benevolent dictator basically to keep us in line, more or less. And it, it has an argument that has some legs to it. Maybe not a lot of legs, but it has some, you know, in centipede terms, it's got some legs, but not, it's missing a number of others. Um, it's worth recognising, I think, that there's something in it uh, before we throw it out. So hegemonic stability idea, developed by a guy called Charles Kindleberger, and then there's uh, some other ones, Robert Gilpin, uh, Keohane, Stephen Krasner. They're all North Americans, and they're all saying we need a single dominant power to stabilise the world system, the Pax Americana, basically, you know, to bring peace, the conditions for trade between countries, stable currency relations, and indeed, if you look historically at the, um, the role of the US dollar, when the US got the upper hand over the British at the end of the Second World War, and the US dollar was the, the de facto global currency, all other currencies were measured against it between 1944 and 1971, when the US wanted to devalue it because it was hurting their own economy. So you've got a period there where there were fixed exchange rates for, what, 17 years. It does help trade. It does help investment. You know what's going to, what the rate's going to be in six months, 12 months, five years' time. You don't need hedge funds to, to buy forward insurance on your investments, all these things. It, there is a benefit there. If, of course, the average person, you and I, we don't trade internationally. We don't invest internationally, even today, when we can do it. But nevertheless, international trade and finance, yes, a fixed exchange rate did help in that sense, that, that Pax Americana. The idea is that this benevolent dictator, the single, the hegemon, it's a softer term to dictator or, or imperial power, the hegemon um, carries the costs of global security. Look, the US is spending 10 times more on weapons than anyone else. Therefore, it is sacrificing its own money to provide the security for all the rest of us. 
So it's self-sacrificing, uh, altruistic, of course, because it's delivering these sorts of benefits. So this, this is a theory that's playing down the benefits to the big power, of course. Um, but it provides public goods, and, and a climate for trade, a climate for uh, uh, currency exchange, and so on. So this, you know, to this day, it's um, it's something that you know, the single superpower idea. All the conditions were set up for this, really, um, when the collapse of the Soviet Union happens in 1991, basically, and we do effectively have a single superpower talking about a new world order and so on. The theory was developed when there was a bipolar world. You know, there was the Soviet Union and their allies, and maybe they weren't as big as the as the Western Bloc, but nevertheless, it was a it was a bipolar world in many senses prior to uh, prior to the 1990s, but. With the 1990s, we have this sort of world, the single superpower idea. But those ideas, when you see, for example, some popular trashy magazine like The Economist talking about this, they're drawing on they're drawing on that idea. You know, they have in mind there are these public goods, there are there is this uh, climate where everyone benefits, and you know, you, from uh, the Pax Americana as they undoubtedly did for, for the Pax Romana when the Romans control the whole Mediterranean region, there were certain sort of benefits in that. So that's what they're drawing on there, hegemonic altruism, a stable world order, a free trade guarantor. Notice they're using some liberal ideas like free trade, but it's not really a liberal theory, because once again we're talking about the international context, and there isn't simple market relations, we're talking about states and so on, So, and of course, not least, we're talking about a state, a very, very strong state, and all the rest of them can be as weak as you like and divided as you like, but one of them has to be very strong. So it's not really a liberal theory in that sense, that's what they call it, that realist or a neorealist theory, um, in the way that they sometimes talk about the conservative side of US politics these days as realists or neorealists, because they're stressing interests. You know, Trump says, US industry wants this, therefore trade war, whatever, you know. It, it, it's realism, it's focus on focus on interests and the Liberals will focus on the double speak more often these days because they're focusing on the idealism somewhat more. Democratic formalism because they say they support independent democratic states but really of course they really want to do business so it doesn't really matter to them too much but they would prefer it to be able to, to badge their allies as Democrats and this single superpower idea is. Uh, and of course what comes with a single superpower idea after 1991 is a series of unilateral disarmament processes. What was behind this thing of all of the members of the Security Council ganging up on Iran and saying to Iran, we're suspicious about your nuclear power industry, we think you might be developing nuclear weapons, never mind Israel, but nuclear weapons. Um, what was the basis for that international law? There was no basis really. But somehow or other, in that period, what was it, in, from the early 2000s, um, when the US had a much stronger role than it does today, um, they were able to convince Russia and China to join with them, and so they had that unilateral disarmament process against Iraq, against Iran, little Libya and other countries and so on. That was part of the idea to disarm states that might be able to defend themselves. And, and then, of course, well, the North Koreans got their nuclear weapons, and then all of a sudden they started talking to them, which is what... Yeah, yeah, rather suspected. <laughs> of course, in that sense, I don't want to say to be too flippant about that because in North Korea, the resistance had its own character for certain reasons. They were let down by the Soviet Union um, and China, really, because China used to be a strong political ally and then they became more business people about their relationship. The Russians, for a period of time, you know, the North Koreans went through a Great Depression, like the Cubans, because they were too dependent economically on that relationship. And, and so they, their idea of self-sufficiency was uh, much more inward-looking, basically. They had Japan there, their old colonial power, and the US occupation of the southern part of the peninsula. They didn't have the potential allies that Cuba had in Latin America, where there was a shared history, and colonial history, and so on. Um, so the Koreans were in the North Koreans were in a rather unfavorable situation and they've had their own approach to resistance that, that is different to others, but let's say. The Cubans emphasized diplomacy more and managed to get a lot of support internationally and they helped by uh, 
air health programs, the air love sport internationally to the point where virtually the whole world was supporting Cuba against, and that's why the Obama administration re-established relationships, recognising their plan to isolate Cuba had failed. The North Koreans didn't have those sorts of possibilities, basically. So, resistance in the Arab Muslim world. Um, this is sort of, we, we've touched on it a bit. Um, I just want to say about the wars, without getting too much into any of the particular wars there, I think there's nine wars in the Middle East now. I believe it's nine, if we include Bahrain, because in Bahrain, uh, the armed resistance began uh, in January this year. They announced an armed resistance in Bahrain. Uh, because effectively Bahrain is a, a branch of Saudi Arabia and the Saudi, Arabia's, Saudi Arabian military helped repress demonstrations there uh, eight years ago and now there's an armed resistance there. With that we've got nine wars and my um, theory is this, my way of looking at this is there is really just one war going on in the Middle East. It's a single war. Um, but there are a number of individual conflicts within that. It's part of a process which was announced um, under the Bush administration in 2006 as the creation of the new Middle East. And the basis of that was to try and destroy all of the independent will in the region using the assets they've got. They've got the Saudis, they've got Israel, they've got their client states in the region which can divide people. Um, and uh, using religion, of course, religion as an Achilles heel that they can make use of to divide people. But it's basically a single war. And they've announced it uh, several times. It's come out in, in, in a number of circumstances, um, including um, through the Obama administration, which spoke about a new relationship with Islam, which means, which meant Gulf monarchy Islam. They were going to use Gulf monarchy Islam to help divide the people. So the initial invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, which most of you will remember, were replaced by what the, the Democrat side of politics called smart power. Now, smart power was an idea that began to be developed in the, in the 1990s, but it's typically more associated with Democrat administrations, although the Republicans being pragmatic will inherit elements of it, basically. It means that, and it, ex it builds on a Pentagon doctrine which talks about full spectrum dominance, that war these days, fourth generation war, some people are talking, fifth generation war, I call it just hybrid war is enough to say that War is linked to propaganda war. It's linked to economic war. Uh, almost every independent people and nation in the Middle East are under some sort of sanctions from the US these days. Iran, Iraq, because the most effective resistance groups in Iraq are under sanction. The most effective resistance groups in Lebanon are under sanction. Um, Syria is under sanction, of course. Palestine is blockaded, has no control over its... Um, external economy. Yemen is blockaded physically. Um, there's a, an economic war going on at the same time as we have these other proxy wars going on and at times occupations. You know, the, the, the occupation of Afghanistan is now what, 18 years old. So uh, that is by and large to destroy independent political will, to weaken those countries to divide the countries, to balkanise the countries, as in the case of Iraq, they tried it with Syria. The region was balkanised in any case a um, uh, hundred years ago. To keep those people divided so they can't come together. And that's why I think we have to pay attention to why there is such an obsession with Iran. There is this obsession with Iran because whatever you think of Iran, it is the one large independent country that is holding out and representing a real threat in terms of being able to link up to the other countries there. If Egypt was a country, if Egypt's political world hadn't collapsed in the, in the 70s, maybe things would be different. Of course, Turkey, there's those three countries, the big countries of the region, um, Turkey, Egypt and Iran, 80, 90 million people, a big complex society with industrial capacity and so on. But Iran is the one independent state there that is seen as the big threat to Israel and to the US in terms of plans to pacify or, or subjugate the entire region. Sorry, Tim. Um, 